We're live. All right. How you guys doing? This is uh, Harrison Fishberg. I'm here with Stefan Kinsella. And just some general questions uh, I want to pose to him regarding IP, uh, copyright, general mis uh, mis you know, confusions within libertarianism and uh, anarchy. So, Stefan, the first thing I have is I play guitar. And I know that you and I are fans of Pink Floyd and superb music. So the question I have is... For instance, when I go and uh, I listen to a song that he wants me to listen to it so they can get, <laughs> they can make profit or they can get, go on tour and all that stuff. So when they play the song, it goes out into the public domain, so to speak, even though it's not really public. My question is, when I go and look at these chords online, I found a bunch of websites that have the, 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 the chords are taken down because the artist, I guess, has claimed that it's violating their copyright to know exactly what the chord structure is they're playing. So basically, my question is, what they're really claiming ownership of is vibration of the strings and the rhythm that they're playing that certain song at. <coughs> now, that, that, that's the extreme that IP goes to in this sense, because a chord is simply just a certain number of keys being played in, in a harmony together, and that's just vibration of strings. So how can they go to a website and say, take this down? You're not allowed to have it because it's stealing away you know, the profits from our artists. I mean, that's essentially what they're doing. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a muddy and complicated issue in today's age uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, it takes a while to untangle this. You have to have clear concepts, clear understanding of the definitions, and what, what, what justice and what fairness and what property rights are all about. Um, it's taken me a while to untangle it, so I'll, I'll just... It's hard to go through the chronological history of how I think you could arrive at conclusions similar to mine, but let me just kind of put them out there and explain what they are. Um, first of all, I think that um, – well, the, the, the bare fact of the reason why they're able to do this is because there exists in our country, in the U.S. and in most other countries, um, some kind of legislated intellectual property rights laws – patent and copyright primarily, primarily copyright in this case. Um, so the reason they can get things taken down is because they can claim a so-called property right in these patterns of information as you, as you just uh, summarized it. Um, to my mind, that's not what literally is going on. What's literally going on is that way of putting it is just the justification given for these laws. But what, but what the reality is of these laws is that um, these laws give to certain people the legal right to stop other people from using their their own property rights as they see fit. Okay, so the copyright idea, the idea that you own the notes, is just a justification for it. So let me take a more stark example. Let's suppose you believe in slavery, as in Aristotle's day. You think there are certain natural classes among people. And normally we have to treat each other with respect, and you can't invade each other's property borders of their bodies. You can't attack someone without a good reason. So that's a presumption of self-ownership or body ownership. But they make an exception in the case of slaves. Okay, So they have to have a reason for that exception. And there's various reasons given. Barbarians have a different property mentality. They're inferior to Greeks or whatever. But th that is just a, a reason or rationale or justification for the rule that they're actually supporting, which they, they don't want to make explicit because the more explicit you make it, the more obviously unjust it appears. But the rule is I get to control my body and you don't get to control your body. Or I get to control my body, and I get to control your body or parts of your body or your life. Um, if you put it that starkly, which is what intellectual property ultimately is, um, it would become transparently um, an unjust rule that no one would uh, no one would agree to. So, in the case of intellectual property, what we have is the government, the state, the federal government in the U.S. case, the United States federal government, um, gives creators of certain innovative works or creative works like patterns of guitar you know notes or whatever gives them the right to go to the court 
and get an injunction or uh, an award of monetary damages against someone who's using their own property in a certain way. Um, and this, if you put it this way, it starts to seem a little fuzzy to libertarians because it's, it sounds contrary to libertarian principles, which it is contrary to libertarian principles. The way it's normally couched is, hey, we all believe in property rights, right? Well, intellectual property is a type of property right. Copyright's a type of IP or intellectual property. Um, so there's a first argument by propaganda or semantics, just kind of labeling something that's a state-granted monopoly privilege as a property right and then persuading people to accept it because they're already naturally in favor of property rights as they should be. And then there's the incentive argument. You know, People understand that there's a natural effect of having nice regulated property rules among landowners and property owners that it also gives people the right incentives to use their property in the most efficient way. It avoids the, the problem of the commons, you know, the tragedy of the commons. Um, uh, it, it, it fosters economic calculation, these kinds of things. So they naturally assume, because the experts and the, uh, you know, the institutional officials tell us this, that IP is just another example of that. Well, if, if property rights in land give you an incentive to take care of your land, then it makes sense for there to be an incentive structure that flows from um, intellectual property rights in your creative works, like you have an incentive to create works, etc. So they sort of go along with it for good motivations, I think. I think they're deceived um, and they're manipulated by the propaganda of the special interest, but that's why most normal people go along with it. They are basically in favor of economic incentives, economic coordination, and property rights, and coordinate, uh, cooperation among people. And they sort of go along with the idea of copyright and patent because they assume that this is part and parcel um, of this kind of property rights scheme. Um, but they're wrong. Uh, in fact, the origin and genesis of copyright is in state censorship and church control of heretical information and trying to prevent people from printing books they want, they don't want to print uh, that the, the the authorities don't want printed and ideas they don't want disseminated and the origin of patent lies in um, state and guild and monopolistic and cartelized control of industries where there's no free competition and where some people have granted official government monopolies over certain practices and trades and then this sort of, over time, became our modern copyright and patent system. Now, we get used to this because, again, it's been integrated into the capitalist substructure of the basic structure of law, private Western law, that the government has co-opted and monopolized. So they've added on to it all these other ideas which people largely go along with. But if you step back and think as a fresh perspective as a libertarian, we are in favor of competition. We are in favor of the transmission of knowledge. We are in favor of learning, right? And, and there's nothing wrong. When you, when you compete with someone who has a new product, um, you're emulating what they're doing. You might improve on it. You might make a duplicate. You might make a shoddier product that's cheaper. Uh, you might make a worse product, and then you go out of business. You might make a better product, and you succeed, and you replace them. Um, as this happened infinite number of times in the history of, of mankind. So the basic presumption is that the free market and competition would permit people to emulate and learn from what others are doing. And if you as a producer or a creator of some innovative work um, choose to reveal private information that's in your head or in your studio to the world for whatever reason you want to do that, um, it's just absurd to expect that people won't learn from it, be influenced by it. Right. In fact, that's a good thing for most people, uh, for most creators, um, and even compete with you and emulate you and maybe vary on what you've done. Um, and then instead of running to the state to get a legislated law that protects you from these people doing that, which is the natural consequence of your revealing information to the world – um, the better solution would be to have a totally free market where people can compete and learn from each other. I mean, even as you just said, though, very quickly, 
um, musicians, they're creative. I don't, I think it's like the only statistic you could say for 100% fact, every musician had a prior person that they were influenced by and they actually learned from and they're like, wow, that song has a great chorus to it or it has a great chord structure or whatever. There's a certain flow to the song that they like and that's why they picked up the guitar or the thing in the first place and started even learning. So, I mean, by you and I even talking, the act of talking and communication is sharing. Um, but again, the main point I was getting at was, if you were to say to someone, you know, d downloading a movie online, they would say, well, you know, you're taking away from the producer's rights or the actor's money or whatever they would say. But the, but the thing with music that I found interesting or just even more asinine is that the only thing that the musician is doing is putting chords that are openly available to anyone who has a, a strings, and they can manage to take those and say, no, these ones are specifically mine and therefore I have ownership over them. It's like, I, you know, you got the cameras and stuff for movies, but a guitar is a vibration of a string, and, and the fact that they can somehow, it just, it just seems like it's very, it's very simple that people would obvi obviously recognize that copyright ownership of chords doesn't make too much sense. Well, I don't, th I agree with you. I don't think they do make, I don't think they think it makes much sense. Even the advocates of it don't think it makes sense. They just don't care. I, I, I think most of them are, um, they're not either, the, they're either very, not very reflective. They don't understand the system um, or they're just totally for their self-interest. Um, so like um, certain software companies, Hollywood, uh, certain patent lawyers, these groups have a vested interest in simply keeping the system going that keeps their monopolistic position going. So they'll they'll use whatever arguments they have to. I think they're completely, um, almost completely intellectually dishonest and and just shills for their own self interest, which I can almost admire in a shark like you know amoralistic sense. At least they're just trying to keep their piece of this pie with government help. It's you know. Um, um, a couple things you mentioned um, make uh, spur, a, spur a couple of comments. Number one, you know, there's this common saying that uh, like immigrants want to come here, and they're happy that we have op relatively open immigration. But as soon as they get here, they want to shut the gates. You know, so they want to get into heaven and shut the gates to heaven's door. Um, there's something like that for artists because I don't know of any artists or inventors or creators who would honestly and sincerely deny that they are they're benefited by and they build on and they're influenced by the work that human society and culture has produced uh, so far. N almost no one will deny that. Um, and yet they want to have it both ways. They want to benefit from the accumulated genius of previous um, people who've released their work into the public domain by one way or the other, uh, and yet they want to protect their own. So it's sort of like these immigrants who come in and they, they want they want to be let in, but they want to shut the doors behind them. Um, you know, we all, everyone admits that we're standing on the shoulders of giants. I don't think anyone denies that. Um, the the problem is these guys are just not sincere arguers. Uh, if if you tell them, well, you were benefited by progress to date, you built upon that, and if you have a monopoly on what you do, progress would stop. And you know you'd be like the last one standing. It's like a Ponzi scheme almost. They they really just don't care. They'll change the subject or something like that. Now, as for downloading, you talked about downloading. Uh, the complaint is often that if you download my music, you're taking away something from me. Now they're kind of vague about this, but if you press them, if you say if they, they'll say, well, you took my song, and if you if you point out the very common sense observation that. Well, I didn't take your song because taking something means I remove it from your control and you don't have it anymore. And you still have a copy of your song. You can do what you want with it. You can perform it. You can um, do variations of it. You can build on it, whatever. So I haven't taken anything from you. I've learned from you, and I'm competing with you perhaps, but I haven't taken anything from you. Well, then they'll switch subject, and they'll say, well, but you're taking from me the money I could have earned. And that's where the rubber hits the road. That's what their real dispute is. They really think they have a property right in the future potential money they could have earned if the government had granted them a monopolistic control um, over this pattern of information, um, which is money that would come from consumers or customers, right? So their argument basically is saying they have a property right in the future dollars in the wallets or bank accounts of future 
potentially non-existent customers. Um, now, I don't know. This is maybe a crazy idea for a libertarian and free market advocate, but it seems to me that if you have a customer out there, they own their money, <laughs> you know, and and they have the right to decide whether to give it or use it for a purchase um, or not. Um, so there is no property rights claim whatsoever on a future income or royalty stream by an author because that would mean you have a property right in the future property of customers that you don't even have a contract with yet, uh, which is absurd um, and makes no sense uh, whatsoever. So, so w when artists complain that they're being stolen from, they're really saying that you're taking from them money that other people own, which they don't have a right to which is basically some kind of bizarre welfare scheme, which is what the IP system, um, in fact, is. Yep, very interesting, yeah. Um, even, even more so, you could, you could even hypothetically buy the CD so the, the artist gets her, his, her, his or her royalties, but the second you hear the music and if you know how to play the song and you can pick up what chords they're playing, you could hypothetically never listen to the album again and go around playing the song and, and just know the lyrics. Of course. And, they would be left out. So, I mean, it's like, again, it's the thing that's, it comes to the, this is what's going to lead into my next question. It comes out into the market, and once it's out there, that's how they get their recognition. They want people to see it, so in order to see it, they have to put it out there. And once it's out there, there's no claim anymore. It's gone. I mean, they can do stuff like touring, and people want to see the legitimate artists. They don't want to see cover bands. They want to go see the real Pink Floyd or the real Led Zeppelin or whatever. So they have the, the name claim or the, you know, the trademark in a non-IP sense of the authenticity, but... What well, I, go, ahead. go ahead. Well, what I was going to say is, um, 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 I think your first point is, is correct. I mean, look, my mom, a simple country woman, used to sing the song Hey Jude to me, the Beatles song. Yeah. Now, I don't think she ever bought a Beatles album, ever. Yeah. Um, uh, how does she know the song Hey Jude? Because she heard it on the radio, she heard people singing it, and she was singing it. Now, so she learned that song by cultural osmosis. There's no possibility of an argument that you could have a contract, which the reason I'm getting to this, this is the fallback argument of the IP advocates. They say, well, if you sell a CD, which is another example you gave, which by the way is 2014, which so this is getting a little bit anachronistic at this point, correct? I mean, buy a song through Spotify I don't know anyone who buys songs through CDs anymore. Um, no, but phys physical media is going away, and that is a sort of brief, temporary uh, mechanism we used, which you could argue there's a, a contractual connection between the seller of this medium and the buyer, although I think that's a ridiculous argument as well, and it would only bind the actual buyers, not all these third parties. So even that contractual argument for IP would make no sense whatsoever. But even that's going away. People get music by streaming or by hearing it or by downloading an ephemeral MP3 file off of some random website on the internet. There's no contractual aspect to this um, whatsoever. So you couldn't pin an IP claim on contract anymore um, um, anyway. Um, now, but what you're getting at with this talk about how art, uh, musicians might make money from performances, etc., that's just one case of the question which often arises, listen, if you want to change the way we're doing things right now in society, like if you want to get rid of copyright law, which purportedly is an incentive structure and lets artists make money, um, and patent law, which apparently or support, purportedly um, uh, induces innovation, technological research and development, etc. If you want to get rid of these things, the burden of proof is on you to show us why that would be justified. Now, I actually don't agree with that. I think the burden of proof is on anyone supporting a state measure, and patent and copyright are clearly state measures. I mean, there's the Patent Act and there's the Copyright Act. These are United States Congress legislated statutes. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why libertarians think that you could have a private simulacrum or version of this, especially when the contract argument fails so miserably. Yeah. Um, so I think the burden is on them, but even, and, and then not only that, their argument is the implicitly utilitarian one. They're assuming that here's how we justify what the law should be. We, we have a panel of experts, distinguished law professors and scholars and uh, politicians, and they decide in their infinite wisdom um, 
how we can adjust the rules that Congress can legislate that covers 300 million people um, to tweak incentive structures to get the results we want. Um, so right away, that's something that should be a red flag. We don't agree with that way of making law. Law should be about justice and property rights and cooperation and how we get along with each other. Second of all, if that's their real argument, they need to have a they need to have evidence. If you're going to say we're going to provide this company a temporary monopoly over their new drug for 17 years, or we're going to provide this artist um, a monopoly over their uh, movie or their novel for 113 years, um, because we think that that will overall incentivize innovation creation in society, the value of which is much greater than the 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 undeniable cost of such a such a federal legislated bureaucratic scheme, then they need to show us what the numbers are, and they never ever do. They don't even try. And the, the economists that have tried over the last hundred or so years pretty much universally conclude that this is all nonsense. I mean, there is just no evidence that the IP scheme actually does increase innovation. Uh, so I'd say the burden proof is on them, and they failed it. And even if the burden proof is on, is on us, we can produce a uh, hundred studies to their one or to their zero that show that it the, the system just doesn't create overall wealth gains for society in an innovative fashion. Um, and it's common sense as well. Uh, if you just think about all the distortions, first of all, the government's inefficient. It's incompetent and it's corrupt, and the laws are manipulated by special interest groups, um, and the borders of the statutory schemes are unobjective and they don't conform to justice, uh, and they're not consistent even with each other or even internally. They're almost completely arbitrary, vague, ambiguous statutes that have nothing to do with justice. They are almost admitted to be deviations from natural property rights. They are legislated at the behest of special interests. They distort and skew the culture, um, creativity, research and development. They hinder research. They penalize people. They give the government an excuse to uh, regulate the internet and to invade Kim.com's home in New Zealand with American um, uh, police state uh, officials. It is just an, an unending, relentless trail of misery and devastation and a huge drag on freedom of speech, uh, internet freedom, and innovation and growth and even the free market um, uh, ever since, and especially has been exacerbated since 1995 or 1998 or so, since the advent of the internet. It's getting worse and worse. It is one of the worst things the state does, in my opinion. It is completely anathema to the free market, private property, and libertarianism. Um, and we need to stop falling for the state propaganda and the propaganda uh, of the special interest groups. Sorry, that was a run-on um, reply, but um, I think I didn't leave anything out. No, you're good. Um, so the other thing, um, this is one of the questions, it might be a little esoteric sounding, but I wrote it down as general optimism being misconstrued negatively in libertarianism. So what I mean by that is I've seen many podcasts with you, and especially Jeffrey Tucker, where they talk about you guys talk about the wonders of the marketplace, and Jeffrey talk, always talks about uh, you know McDonald's and how it's providing all these goods and services at such low prices. And um, you know, look back just two or three hundred years ago, the average person, the average king was you know our poor person now or whatever. You know, the standard of living has gone exponential, and there really is a lot of. I mean, look what we're doing right now. You've you've never met Rothbard in person, am I correct? No, I did. No, I, I did. Uh, no, November nineteen ninety four at the uh, John Randolph Club meeting. Um, about three months before he died, I did. I had a great talk with him, and it was it was. Um, I'm I'm glad I did. Right. Okay. I was I was I can't remember if it was you or but. So you met him once, but I mean, just the fact that I am, I can meet up with you now and do Skype, and you and I can do these conversations and yes. talk to I mean, this is like an unbelievable thing for not yes. only education, but for just general networking and general, uh, you know, the human experience of just being able to meet people that you look up to and have these conversations. This is going uh, big time with it. But the question I have is, 
there's a lot of the standard of living is rising in certain aspects and I wouldn't want to be alive at any other time. But the thing that I'm coming to is a lot of the times when you get into discussions with people and you start bringing in the moral arguments, the ethical arguments, economic arguments, we're very open in terms of libertarian ideals of being like, live and let live, let people do what they got to do without, but then it somehow manages to get pushed back that <clears throat> it seems like there's always a negative connotation that comes that somehow you're co-op, you're helping special interests or you're only a corporate person or you, you only care about people making money and you're evil. It, you know, you know, do you understand what I mean? It somehow goes from actually our general love for humanity and what it can bring to the table and people will somehow skew it to being like you're just a profit seeking parasite or something like that. And I don't see how those two they, they always seem to conflate. I don't know if you see that. No, I th I think I know what you mean. I think there's a tension or a a murkiness in discussions among liberty minded people about tactics and strategy and personal life choices versus truth and substance. And they get intermingled and I think it's okay to mix these things up because we're complicated people. <coughs> I mean, I'm a, I'm sort of host, uh, I'm sort of skeptical of this, the coherence of this thick, this thick idea, this thick libertarian idea, and the thick thin debate. But I think I see why it's being driven. And of course, I acknowledge that, and everyone knows that we're not just we're not just libertarians. We're we're people who live in the real world. And some of us are more interested in different things. We have division of labor. We have different interests, etc. So I think one thing that happens is you have different levels of li yeah, people that are just new into liber libertarianism, and they, they come in through, say, Ron Paul or pol politics, and so they may be more into strategy and tactics, and some of these people are hard to talk to because if you say something like, um, I don't think the income tax is going to be meaningfully reduced in the next 30 years in my life, then they'll just throw their hands up and say, well, then what's the point? Well... Because they're fixated on making change now. And when you're fixated on making change now, usually through politics, then you're going you're gonna to get disillusioned really quickly. If that's your goal, then you're going to give up on the whole movement pretty quickly. I've seen this happen many times. Um, if that's not your goal and you're more realistic about it, then it may be harder to motivate yourself, but then you have to step back and think, I mean, this is part of the, as Socrates called it, the examined life, in my opinion. Um, Look, I see no personal obligation for people to be obsessed over politics or economics. Um, I think there's nothing wrong with just living your life and just being a decent person. I think there's some value, at least to some people, of being reflective and getting interested in this stuff. Um, to my mind, uh, what I think is valuable about it, and is valuable not just for me but for lots of people, is just the general sense of being part of being on the right side of history. Um, you're part of the struggle for liberty against evil or good against evil. Um, for me, that's enough. For some people, that's enough. Maybe it slows down my fervor a little because I know that I'm not going to change the world in three days. But I'm not going to burn out either. So everyone has different approaches, and I think that is, um, that's fine. As for the time that's better to live in, I think I've heard people say they'd rather live in the 50s in the U.S., but I don't know if you'd want to be a prosperous young black male today living in the 50s as opposed to now. So everyone's situation is different, although, although the other hand, the, the black families have been decimated repeatedly over the generations in the U.S. by various um, artifacts and fallouts of slavery and uh, state control of of, of systems and you know artificial racist uh, laws and things like that. Um, so I think some people are better off now. Some people would have been better off 100 years ago or 50 years ago. Um, overall, I think things are getting better, but some things are getting worse. I mean, as technology improves, we have a better chance. And this is one reason why I'm so fervent about IP is because I do think the advent of the Internet is one of the um, um, unexpected uh, tools that's emerged that is a huge um, uh, tool in our arsenal that we have against state control. And the state is sort of starting to glimpse this. And it's almost too late for them to shut it down, I believe. They probably would have shut it down if they'd realized this in 1995, but they haven't. So, But now they're using copyright as one of the excuses to start regulating internet freedom. So this is one reason I'm in favor of 
uh, or opposed to IP controls and IP extensions is because I'm so much in favor of technology as a tool of freedom. And I think the tools of freedom, the tools of technology, sorry, the tools of technology help the state as well as us, but they help us disproportionately, I hope, I think. I'm trying not to be Pollyanna. Uh, I want to I recognize there's a possibility of disaster coming. Um, you know, the Grey Goose Syndrome or whatever. Um, you know, the idea that there's a reason we haven't detected life in outer space, and that's because every society that gets to a certain level of intelligence destroys itself by one way or the other, probably because of some kind of state. <laughs> um, so I'm hopeful that that's not the case. So, I mean, Jeff, Jeff, for example, so back on the optimism thing, Jeff Tucker, who's a good buddy of mine, um, is very optimistic. He's very cheerful. That's his strategy. That's his demeanor. Um, and to me, that goes a little bit more to the tactic strategy side of things, and that's his approach, and that's fine. I try to be a little bit more cautious and a little bit more aloof. I am hopeful, and I want to push for the things I think have some hope. Even if I ultimately lose, I just want to be on the right side of things when if things go bad. But I do think that there's a chance for the market and technology to finally uh, overcome the – I mean, look, I think what's, what's there a greater chance of? If we're going to have some kind of radical advance in liberty and freedom in the future, let's say in the next 20, 30, 50, 100 years, is it that we persuade the masses by Mises' books and lectures to gradually increase their economic literacy and to persuade the legislators to start voting for libertarian policies? Or is it something else? I don't think the first is very likely. I don't think it's a waste to try it. But I think that something else has got to happen for us to start achieving more liberty. And I think that's going to be more prosperity because of the market, despite the state's interventions. It's going to be a greater technology that allows us to fight the state at an ever um, 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 greater rate than the state can surveil us. Um, so I, I'm hopeful that to me, it's like a tipping point kind of thing. We have to, or, or it's more like a, uh, what do you call it when you escape the gravity well of the Earth when you get into orbit? You have to, you have to reach a certain escape velocity. We have to reach a certain escape velocity in society. And I'm cautiously optimistic that technology plus free markets can can do that. Um, there's going to be a lot of tragedy between now and then. A lot of wasted lives. A lot of uh, stunted lives because of the state. Um, but that's just a numbers game. I don't know what else we can do about that. So that, that's kind of my overall... Um, uh, you asked something about McDonald's and corporate. I don't know if that's really relevant now. I think that this is an example of what your strategical focus is. You're trying to point out the uh, examples of uh, the beneficial effects of the relatively free aspects of the market like how McDonald's can serve so many people and give them nutrition. Uh, yeah, it's not ideal. The paleo diet people might not like it. Um, the, 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 the Carsonians, the left libertarians might point out that McDonald's um, benefits from corporate subsidies or tax breaks or government roads uh, or the corporate structure itself. And I don't disagree with all that. But to me, at a certain point, this bleeds into predictionism. Like we're all trying to predict an alternative, you know, an alternate history or counterfactual history. What would the world look like if X wouldn't have happened? Or what should it look like? Or what do we predict it will look like in the future? These are all speculative, I believe. You can have your opinions. You can have your preferences. You could prefer a world of more self-sufficient, smaller family businesses and less employment, less bosses. You could prefer a more efficient world of even bigger corporations or think that's going to happen in the absence of the state. But the fundamental thing is we're opposed to the state and we want whatever the free society produces um, to happen. So I'm willing to, to take the experiment and see. I'd be happy to um, release the shackles on the economy and see whether it's going to look like the left libertarian world or the kind of right libertarian, capitalist, uh, industrialized society vision. To me, these are just interesting predictive differences. I might predict this, you predict that. 
and we can talk about that, and they're interesting. But I don't know if it proves anything in the fundamental sense. So uh, this kind of links up in a way, like th this is off topic, but to what you were speaking on. In terms of the McDonald's thing, and it's a, it's a corporate structure or the, the federal road, that obviously plays a huge part. The fact of the matter is, though, is that humans act towards you know rational ends. And regardless of what the structure is in place, people are going to do what benefits them best. So I mean, is there really, that's the thing, it's like the stock market. Uh, the 2007 crash with the real estate bubble and all that jazz. The reality was is that these people on Wall Street were really just taking what was the mark, what was, you know, they were taking what the environment has given them and they ran with it and they caused a lot of ha ha BS and there was not, there was not a need for it in a sense. But it's like, if you were to find a lottery ticket on the ground, I guess, would you take it? Or if you were to be given, you know, unlimited funds at a casino or if you, you know, went bankrupt, they would, they would refill your, your coffers. I mean, humans act towards those rational goals or those ends. So, I mean, there is a aspect of regardless of where the society goes. Well, okay, so so that's that's a good set of um, of, of launching points. Um, well, first, I would say that this is one reason why libertarians tend to oppose a large state, um, and the radical libertarians among us, including me, oppose the state at all. But the idea is that the larger the state becomes and its control of things, the greater is the incentive to gear your life towards being part of the state, manipulating the state, doing things that are inefficient. Um, uh, you know, I've heard a common observation that you know, if the income tax was 1% instead of roughly 30%, 40% on average, then you know, companies wouldn't spend as much time trying to avoid it. They would just pay it. It would be a fairly trivial fee. It wouldn't distort the structure of the economy as much. It wouldn't lead to as much corruption, as much bribery, as much um, um, uh, inefficient government programs as we have now. Um, so that's one reason just to oppose the size of the state. Um, um, you know, as for things like you know the roads that serve companies. I mean, by and large, the state is is a minority group of people that that are parasitical off of the productive economy, and the only way that arrangement can survive is if they're relatively small compared to the productive class and if the productive class goes along with it because they're bigger, right? So they have to voluntarily go along with it. The, the smaller group can't easily by force enslave or control the productive class. So the way they do it is by propaganda and other institutional state measures. And those largely have to cater to some common sense ideas and needs. I mean, everyone knows that roads are in general a necessary and good thing. So the government co-ops, or education, public education, uh, or even having social security at the end of your life, people kind of vaguely sense these are things that they might want in a private way or that are necessary. And so the state co-ops these things. So the things the state tends to do often are just inefficient or corrupt simulations of what would happen on a free market. You would have way of, ways of dealing with criminals. You would have ways of defending yourself from an invading army. You would have some kind of a, a medical insurance or medical uh, protective system. Um, so the government co-ops, you know, you, you know, people would want to mail letters to each other. So it's not outrageous or crazy that the government has a post office. We understand why. You know, if the government tried to establish an, a bureau of administering poison to people on a daily basis, it wouldn't fly with the voters. You know, so these things tend to approximately draw on the common sentiments. So that's one reason why these things, I think, survive as well. Because you know, libraries are not an inherently bad thing. So if you make it public, then people might accept it, um, etc. Um, as for things that – and I already mentioned the benefit, the benefit part. I think that people do – well, let, let me mention one other thing. There's a common expression, and I think we should distinguish here between the Austrian and sort of the, um, the, the classic the, – the, the mainstream economic point of view, uh, homo economicus, the idea that we're all economical actors. Um, in the Misesian sense, I think it's true. I think that in a, in a sense, which is almost trivial okay, because it's almost tautologically true. Every action you perform is in your self-interest. In the sort of standard economic model, all we care about is monetary profit. Now, I think they think that's an approximation, but that's obviously not true. If all you cared about was money, 
But let me just give one simple observation. No one would ever buy anything. You would never give up your dollars to per make a single purchase. I would never buy a can of Coke, Coca-Cola, for my dollar because I value the dollars more than anything in the world. Well, obviously, every time there's an exchange, a monetary exchange, the person that's the purchaser is valuing something more than money. So people all the time value things more than money. So that's the first insight. So we're not always homo economicus, and we don't always value material goods more than other types of goods. Now, the Misesian point of view, the Austrian economic point of view, I think handles this easily because Mises just says that humans act in a framework of ends and means. Basically, every time you act, you're trying to achieve some kind of goal, some kind of end in the world, and you use means, including your human action and your body and your labor and your effort and your thought and other things that you own or you can possess, other tools, to achieve that end. So that's the structure of human action. You're always trying to change the course of events to make the future be different than what you expect it to be, to be what you would prefer it to be. Okay, so the ultimate end of action for, for Austrians is not a thing, is not the ownership of some scarce resource necessarily. It could be, but it, that's just one example of the end. Um, the ends of human action are almost never an ownable thing. It's just a state of affairs that's different than you would otherwise choose. So it's not this materialistic... Um, it could be spiritual, it could be mental, it could be psychological, it could be undefinable. I don't know. But it's whatever your goal of your action is, whatever you want to achieve, as long as it's rational. And for me, as it's rational means the means you select to achieve the end, um, you have a reason to believe that they are causally efficacious. That means there's, they can help cause, they will help you achieve your end. You know, If you want to live 15 years longer and you have cancer and you choose arsenic as your drug, that's irrational. You know, un unless, you know, unless you somehow believe the arsenic will cure cancer, in which case it's just a failure. Okay? But th that's the structure of human action. So I don't think we need to think of people as only benefiting themselves. And so the reason I say this is because I don't think that everyone values only money or political influence. Okay? So even if we have a system like we have now, where there's more massive opportunity for people to um, um, use their special interests or use influence or bribe legislators in a legal way maybe, but bribe them nonetheless. Um, I don't think everyone votes according to their narrow self-interest as the classical economists would call it. They do, as, call, as Mises would say, but those interests might be spiritual. So you have people quite often. I mean, I think uh, David Koch... I'm sorry, Charles Koch wrote a great op-ed a couple days ago where he explained that Koch Industries has lobbied against certain federal government regulations and measures that in the short term or narrow self-interest of that company would have benefited it because they really have a deeper value, which is the free market and freedom and a free economy and free competition. So they have pushed for things that in the homo economicus point of view would be against their self-interest. Why do they do that? And they do, so people do this all the time. Um, they sacrifice for their children. They save up. They will. They will vote what what they think is morally right, even if it it wouldn't narrowly benefit them. I mean, there's a reason the Republican Party is popular among Joe Sixpack, even though if you think about it, um, Joe Sixpack, you know, the union worker kind of guy, is kind of a lower middle class blue collar worker whose narrow interests you would think were aligned with the Democrat Party, right? Because they, they're going to get uh, minimum wage protections and uh, various redistributive measures that control interests. But why do they vote Republican? Now, I'm not saying they're right to be Republicans, but I'm just saying that people do things all the time that are against their narrow monetary self-interest because they have values other than just money, again, which is demonstrated by the simple fact that people sometimes spend money. Um, so I sent you in the, I know you haven't read it, but, uh, let me see. Alan Moore, do you know who Alan Moore is? The author for V for Vendetta. He did the, um, oh yeah, sure. Book called, um, Watchmen. Yes. Yeah. I've read Watchmen. Okay, so 
he's got this quote about anarchy, and I will just uh, paraphrase the last part. He says, um, I believe that all other political states are in fact variations or outgrowths of a basic state of anarchy. After all, when you mention the idea of anarchy to most people, they will tell you it's a bad idea because the biggest gang would just take over. He then goes on to say, this is pretty much how I see contemporary society. We live in a badly developed anarchist situation in which the biggest gang has taken over and declared it to be an anarchist uh, and declared that it is not an anarchist situation, that it's either capitalist or communist. But I tend to think that anarchy is the most natural form of politics for a human being to actually practice. So what he's essentially saying is that anarchy, so to speak, is the soil of the human, the human world, and these outgrowths that we see really are just, you know, poisoned soil, or you know, they're, 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 it's bad soil that has just grown these these bad trees. But do you have any take on that? Because I do see, and this relates to. Let me just jump into this one real quick. This relates to the idea of the market, and I brought this up with you before. When Stefan Molyneux or some other characters say something along the lines of, like, in the 1950s, the market was more free. I don't see that as the case because, to me, the Rothbard statement, which is that the market is simply the social array of the voluntary exchange of goods and services, that means the market's always there regardless. In the sense that you could have a, you can have a, a, a Holocaust camp, there's technically a market within the, the, the camp. There's individuals interacting and trading with each other and trying to better their situation for tomorrow. Or the, so it's like, it's a very general, widespread, open view. But is it really all anarchy in the sense that even if someone's imposing on you saying, don't do this, you still have the choice to do so. There's going to be consequences that you may not like. What we're seeing is, is I, I, if you get the gist, I think. But. I think that um, this is an example of why it's important to have precise terminology because you can throw these terms all around and then you can start getting into uh, confusion. Um, uh, not you, and I don't know about Alan Moore. I, I had a vague impression he was um, some kind of quasi, uh, I want to say statist, but he wasn't like really with us in the true anarcho-libertarian sense. Um, um, despite the, despite some of the themes in Watchmen, um, in, in some trivial senses, so there's a famous essay in the JL Journal of Libertarian Studies by um, Cousin, Al Alfred, Alfred or Albert Cousin, called "Do We Ever Really Get Out of Anarchy?" Right. Um, and so, in I won't say in a trivial sense, but in in a trivial sense, we are always in anarchy. Number one, in the world today, we have 200 roughly nation states, which are roughly in anarchy with each other. There's no overlord state, and yet um, they get along with each other. If you really believe that anarchy was unstable or that um, you need uh, a monopolistic control of law and order, then you would have to be in favor of a one-world government, which is m one of my arguments against some of the objectivists. And they've kind of admitted this, but they sort of brush it off, and they say, well, in today's culture, that would be a disastrous mistake. So I, don't, I don't know what they mean by that. Um, but Cous what Cousin argues is that Within a, within a government or a state, you could call it, like the United States government, there's no central overlord power that forces them to comply with all these internal rules that govern the structure of the state. Uh, in fact, I've been more and more impressed uh, with um, the sort of overall perspective on the state by um, uh, Creveld, Martin Van Creveld, um, who views the state in its modern sense, as a modern entity. Like, he doesn't think that the Roman Empire was a state in the modern sense because in the last roughly two, three hundred years, we've had the modern state arise, which which he views as, as an institution or like a corporation with a life of its own, in a sense, whose identity doesn't depend upon the particular um, people who populate its bureaucratic roles or its, or its actually political roles. So... He would view the state in the U.S. as this central kind of leviathan that exists in a way independent of, say, Barack Obama, which is just the current administration, yeah, yeah. which in a way shows the, the futility of politics. I mean uh, the current politicians that are elected come and go. Um, 
And so the idea that we can vote the right ones in is futile because they're not even the ones that control things. I don't think Barack Obama can come into the government. I don't think Rand Paul can come into the government um, as president and just have an edict on day one and bring about a quasi-libertarian society. You would have rebellion uh, by these various institutions, lots of viscosity, lots of friction, lots of pressure to stop it, and I think it would be stopped. Um, um, so I think the state is sort of like a problem uh, um, un unto itself. Anyway, what Kuzan points out is that within this government, there's no overlord that oversees them. It's just an interlocking set of rules. So his point in a way is that we always have anarchy because there's no god above us, at least one that is interfering like an overlord, who, who makes us comply with some kind of constitutional scheme or some kind of rules. It's an interlocking set of rules. There's a, a complex interplay of different layers of, of checks and balances and um, uh, powers against powers and things like that. So his point is that the question is what flavor of anarchy do we want or what type of anarchy do we want? And that sounds to me a little bit like what um, Alan Moore is saying. And that's fine as far as it goes, but I think it's a little trivial because it, it, it doesn't kind of get us to the, the nub of the issue. Um, well, what's the nub of the issue then? Because the, what he's saying essentially is just that, again, it's just, it's just a state of, the, the, you know, the human beings go away tomorrow. The globe's still floating, doing whatever it's doing. We come back, we're just going to impose whatever values or ideals we have. But that just comes naturally. If people want to be aggressive and impose their will upon people and there's a apparatus, so to speak, of the state, they're going to go there and just do it anyway. It's not like... Well, that's so that leads to another... So, okay, give me a second. So uh, what I would say is uh, an analogy I'm thinking of is, 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 is uh, the question of property rights. So libertarians quite often say, well, what we believe in is private property rights and everyone else believes in communism or something like that. Um, I think that's – a better way to look at it is that every political system, almost every person has some perspective on what property rights are appropriate because yes. a property right is just a legally recognized, which means a widespread, institutionalized, systematized way of recognizing what's going to happen, what rules will be enforced. It's a way of deciding who should have the right, the legally – the right to control – a given scarce resource. So in that sense, every system recognizes property rights. So then if you step back and say, well, then what makes libertarians different than others? Because they all we, we all believe in property rights. Um, and the, diff the difference is we believe in assigning property rights in a particular way, which is basically locking in first homesteading rules combined with contract, in order to achieve social peace, cooperation, and society. That is what our goal is, informed informed by economic analysis. That is, we understand the role of property rights. We understand scarcity. We understand basic, at least basic economics. And all these insights come together to inform our vision of what the property rights allocation rules should be. Every other group, from the libertarian, it's almost like atheist versus religionist. From the atheist point of view... Not to say every libertarian is an atheist, but from the atheist point of view, you're either a theist or you're not a theist. That's why atheist. And from the atheist point of view, it's there's a difference between Jews and Muslims and Christians and Buddhists, but it's not an important difference. It's just a flavor. They're basically all theists of a certain type. Likewise, from the libertarian point of view, um, we are the only one that believes strongly in a consistent, principled self-ownership, which means we're the only political philosophy or political theory that opposes slavery. Basically, every other political theory you can come across will end up endorsing one form of slavery, whether partial or complete, whether temporary or permanent, uh, over full self-ownership. Now, they give different justifications for it. The conservatives will say, well, we believe in liberty, but it's not our only value. Now, whenever you hear that, hold on to your wallet because they're coming after your wallet, yeah. you know, or they're coming after your body, because they're going to say, "Well, we believe in liberty, but we also believe in stopping pornography, so or drugs, um, so we need to have a balance." You know, they all say this kind of thing. So they're all basically advocates of slavery in in one form or the other. So to me, the fundamental difference. Now let's go back to anarchy. So 
the fundamental difference of anarchy is the reason we call ourselves anarchists is not because we hate authority. It's not because we bristle at the nature of social reality and the fact that people are different or not egalitarian. It's simply that we prefer interpersonal peace, social cooperation. We have some empathy for each other. We want a society where everyone gets along and can use resources peacefully. And therefore, we prefer these rules that the Lockeans and the Libertarians uh, suggest. And therefore, we oppose aggression. And therefore, we oppose the state because we recognize that the state necessarily employs aggression. So for us, we oppose the state just because it's a species of aggression, which is a species of um, invasion of the property rights that are necessary for flourishing and cooperation and prosperity and human society and peace. So for us, it's not a rebellion against authority. It is, it is a consequence of our, our pro-society, pro-cooperation values. And I think if you are in favor of just general civility and cooperation and human prosperity, and you have a little bit of empathy for your fellow man, and you have a little bit of economic literacy, you're going to tend to start being more and more of a radical libertarian and a radical libertarian anarchist in the end. Yeah, I mean, just in terms of uh, authority, I'm giving up. You know, I'm not giving up, but I. This is a this is a position of you giving information to me. I'm I'm a subject. I'm a student of you. I'm I'm more than happy to be under an authority in a sense of enlighten me with your knowledge, and I'll compare it to how I see reality, etc. I speak to other. So I mean, yeah. Again, that's that comes back to the misconstruing of the, like we're against all authority, and then that's what they throw it at us. It's like no, no, we're. It's just a very odd dynamic that ends up breaking down. Are, are you have time or do you need to run? Um, I got to go shortly, but we can talk uh, maybe five or ten more minutes if you like. Okay. Let me see. Um, so let me, let me just look at one or two things very quickly. Uh, and I, I don't mind having a part two if you want to. That might be better anyway to break it up for people. So if, you, okay. if we have more stuff. Because it always takes longer to cover these things than, yeah. than you think. You can never do it in 25 minutes. Because you have three three things that take forty five minutes. It's just the way it works. Because it it because I'm long winded and it takes a long time to explain these things. No, this was great. Uh, yeah, we did it. We did a whole hour. So I will um, I'll clean up some of my questions and at least we got a few of them out of the way. And again, I'd like to do another discussion. So I appreciate your time and all the knowledge. Yeah, let's do that. Why don't we do this? Um, well, let me say goodbye and then we'll talk for a second. So um, I appreciate this. I enjoyed it. And, um, and uh, for, for listeners, we'll probably have a, a part two coming up. Okay?